Well, a hearty welcome to you all to this auspicious occasion in Sweden, where the Oral Nicotine Commission has organized an event to specifically focus on the category of oral nicotine pouches. Now, the mission of the Oral Nicotine Commission is to make sure that the benefits and risks of oral nicotine pouches are properly communicated to especially consumers, health professionals, and governments, so that oral nicotine pouches can take its place as one of the most important tools in tobacco control and also harm reduction in not only Sweden, but all the countries of the world. The reason why it's in Sweden today is there's a very important reason. Uh, within the next week or so, the Swedish government will be announcing the latest smoking prevalence rates in Sweden, which has now dropped to a remarkable 5.6% of adults, adults in Sweden. Now, uh, we all know that the aspirational goal of the World Health Organization, and for most member states, is to have a smoke-free end game, so the end of cigarettes and its replacement by less harmful uh, nicotine alternatives or quitting altogether, which we all know is the best method. But it's quite remarkable that Sweden as a country has managed to almost by stealth uh, reach this end game well before most of the other member states within the World Health Organization. And that is the reason why we are here today as part of our hybrid meeting is to pay respect to Sweden as probably uh, one of the world champions in tobacco control. And perhaps Sweden has better read the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And we're so honored to have uh, Derek Yachia, who is very instrumental in the design and the initial promotion of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, some of us will who enjoy the detail would know that Article 1D of the FCTC states explicitly that tobacco control also includes harm reduction strategies. What that means in practice is that if adult smokers would depart from combustible cigarettes and head for the fire escape and uh, switch to less harmful non-combustibles, such as oral nicotine pouches, oral tobacco, which is widely used in, in Sweden in the form of snus, uh, electronic cigarettes or otherwise called electronic nicotine delivery systems, ENDS, and then also heated tobacco products. If all the smokers of the world today, and there are 1.1 billion smokers in the world today, if all of them were to switch to one of these classes tomorrow, or if they were to quit, then we would have a tremendous impact on population health worldwide. In fact, if you look at population studies, then we know that the four most important chronic diseases, which are lung diseases, heart diseases, diabetes, and cancer, of which 80% are related to tobacco use, cause more than 64% of premature mortality in the world. So people who die before they should is due to these chronic diseases, and 80% of these diseases are linked to the use of combustible tobacco. So it's a big deal. And the fact that Sweden has been able to push down their smoking prevalence to such a low rate is certainly a model that should be replicated in all other parts of the world. First in the EU, where Sweden will be in the presidency over the next, in the first six months of next year, but then also all over the rest of the world. Now, for that reason, the Oral Nicotine Commission, as well as our partners, various websites, the, the Africa and Asia Harm Reduction Alliances, the Campaign for Safer Alternatives in Africa, and the TobaccoHarmReduction.net uh, platform, we would like to dedicate this the next two hours to listening to a, a number of outstanding champions in this area who can help us walk through the benefits, the risks of the category, how Sweden has been able to embrace harm reduction to the successful levels that they have, and then also to look at some other aspects of oral nicotine. 
we are privileged to have Professor Mihaila Rescu, who is a professor of oral health at, uh, in, in Romania, University of Bucharest. And we have Professor Solomon Ratemane, who is a psychiatrist, and he'll speak to the unique place that harm reduction can play in mental health. We also have Dr. Jose Detlape, who's a former president of the World Medical Association. And then we also have uh, Joe Maguero, who is the president of CASA in Kenya, who will join us online. But it's my big privilege to first ask Derek Yach to speak to us about the global, the global health aspects of oral nicotine. And just a quick word of introduction. Uh, Derek is truly one of the global health champions of our generation who's had a career both in the public sector and even in the private sector. And I'd say the common thread in all of that has been, and I asked Derek some 15 years ago, what, what, when you wake uh, in the morning, what do you think of professionally? And he would say it would to prevent disease and premature death. And he knows that in tobacco, we have the biggest potential return on investment. He was a director within the WHO. He was the director at the Medical Research Council in South Africa. He was then part of academia at Yale University. He then was the, uh, the head of global health at the Rockefeller Foundation, and then had a series of private sector interventions, almost as an impact player. At PepsiCo, we helped with the Performance with Purpose project, where they pushed all of their products from, let's say, less healthy to more healthy. He's been involved with the Smoke Free Foundation, and now he's an independent global health advocate who's, as Derek always does, has made an impact to prevent disease and premature death. Derek, please. Thanks, Dylan, and uh, a real pleasure, fantastic pleasure to be here. And um, let me say also, um, it's, it's wonderful to see um, people who gave so much support to the Framework Convention. Um, let me start off by thanking you, Dylan. People forget that at the time, the World Medical Association was a key player in any WHO strategy um, under your leadership. Anders Milton was um, one of the most um, influential people across the, the world medical scene, who also at the time recognized the central importance of the leadership of physicians and other health professionals, something I feel we've kind of slipped away from. Um, but I have to say that for me, it's an extraordinary privilege um, to be joined in a session with two true giants of uh, global tobacco control, uh, Lars Ramstrom and Carl Fagerstrom. Um, between them, they really have contributed to our understanding of the benefits of SNUS uh, to smokers seeking to cut their risks. And certainly in the case of Carl, to our deeper appreciation of the risk of nicotine and the way we measure nicotine and nicotine dependence. Um, Last was instrumental in the first WHO reports on smoking and health in the 1970s. And um, it was that, that work which he did, and um, we were privileged to have a chance to print out a copy from the 1970 report and have him autograph it after all these years. We forget that those were the reports that led to the first resolutions of the World Health Organization on smoking all those years ago. Now, the very first action that the WHO took was uh, to urge, not to demand, urge the people in the room of the World Health Assembly to try and refrain from smoking during the deliberations in the 1970s. We've come a far way. <clears throat> um, I must say though, we have neglected the wisdom of uh, Carl and Lars for far too long. And I plead Mayor Kalpa for not drawing upon Lars's recommendations to WHO over 20 years ago when he would come to our offices, show us data over and over and over. Um, but our general view at the time was that the benefits of SNUS were overblown and this was merely an industry ploy. How terribly wrong we all were. I think we need to make up for that very much faster. Let me jump forward now. So the recent evidence uh, is certainly leading to progress um, and um, I think that when I look at the new evidence, for me, one of the most exciting pieces is coming from Sweden. Uh, Dr. Aragi from the Karolinski Institute and, uh, and the team 
around the Karolinska Institute, recently released the latest update on SNOS based on nine major cohort studies involving 400,000 people covering 9 million person years. Now, those numbers are huge. They're huge compared to almost any other intervention that we take action on at a world level. We didn't do studies of that size in vaccines before the COVID vaccines were released. We haven't done studies on that to decide whether to use statins or to use a wide variety of drugs in common use. Yet their study showed there was no association between SNUS use and oral cancer and simply strengthened the case that's been made by Lars and others for decades, and we're not acting upon it at the global level. I would hope that we'd start seeing that, uh, who I've never met, uh, Dr. Aragi and, her, and his or her team, really need to be seen as the Richard Peter and um, Dahl team um, of the SNUS and oral cancer world, and given the same accolades and broadcast in every single country so that we know we have got solutions, they're simply not being picked up. And I think we also want them to publish as soon as possible data, I'm sure they have, showing what happened to SNUS users during the COVID pandemic here in Sweden. I have no doubt that they would have shown a substantially lower risk of complications and death uh, compared to never smokers. And this data from this country could be the most powerful way of demonstrating that once and for all. Um, the second set of work was led by a, a good friend and colleague, Kotha Hajat, and her friends, which went broader than just Sweden and classified um, all oral, looked at all oral tobacco products and really came to the conclusion in a major piece that we cannot lump all oral tobacco uh, products in one big basket. SNUS confers no excess risk for oral cancers or for many other cancers, yet is lumped along with some of the most toxic forms of smokeless tobacco that we have in India that account for India's massive epidemic of oral cancers. Based on the evidence that we have coming out of all of your work, it's not surprising that the US FDA authorized Swedish matches SNUS as being appropriate for the protection of public health under its MRTP guidance. That's a very high and very strict standard, and uh, SNUS was the first, and I think still the only product to go through the MRTP process. Um, so if people say that there isn't a regulatory body uh, endorsing the use of SNUS to re re reduce risk, they need to turn to the US FDA and recognize that it's the same standard of evidence used for vaccines or pharmaceuticals or food safety that now applies in the area of SNUS. Sadly, WHO still does not distinguish between oral tobacco risks for cancer. And I keep checking to see when this is going to happen. Um, in the latest report they put out just 10 days ago on oral um, health, which is generally a very good report, the first report updating oral health issues in 20 years, um, they have a very sound section on oral cancer, reminding us of the 350,000 deaths from oral cancer in South Asia. But their recommendations miss the opportunity to support the displacement of these toxic products by SNOS and nicotine pouches. And, to go, and they go further and even raised unscientific concerns about nicotine from vaping, potentially having negative effects on oral cancer. There's not a shred of evidence to suggest this, yet it's in a formal WHO report of just 10 days ago. I hope the dentists and many in the oral health community will read the report and recognize there is a massive opportunity uh, ahead. So let me end off with a few uh, very specific points. Five ideas about what I see the potential is of nicotine pouches to enhance global health and the environment, and I put the two together. Note that we don't have the quality of research on nicotine pouches that we have on SNUS, but we should start using a bit of common sense and recognize that the exposure assessment of what is inside a nicotine pouch will tell you pretty swiftly that inside a nicotine pouch is nicotine and virtually nothing else compared to even SNUS where you would still have the, the products associated with tobacco plants and maybe some of the contaminants along the way. So if there's going to be a risk profile done, which there has to be, we are likely to see that nicotine pouches are going to have a much more substantially lowering risk potential than even SNUS, which is pretty low. 
and should probably be in the range of any other nicotine replacement therapy, maybe lower if it's derived from synthetic nicotine. So what are the potentials? First, and this is the one I feel strongest about because of the horrific consequences of oral cancer. It could affordably displace toxic products so common across South Asia and lead to the elimination of oral cancer. And I use the word elimination in the technical sense of which it's meant. You can only eliminate things when they are caused by a major, single major factor. We could eliminate the toxic forms of smokeless tobacco in India, and the results would be enormous. I remind people that um, not only are there 350,000 deaths, but we've known about this for over 100 years. In 1908, um, the, uh, one of the journals in uh, India published a report, the very first report on cancer in Travancore, and documented exquisitely the relationship between tobacco and betel nut put in the mouth and where in the mouth the cancer forms in exquisite detail. In fact, with the exception of um, scrotal cancer, which we won't get into, caused in, by chimney sweeps, there were very few examples at the time of knowing that a specific set of factors caused cancer. This one was documented in 1908. When I reported this uh, to one of the National Planning Commission heads in India many years ago, his first reaction was, well, nobody's brought that to my attention. And I said, but it's been in the literature for 100 years. Anyway, so that is number one. Number two, we know that nicotine pouches could help users of combustible cigarettes and BDs switch affordably to clean forms of nicotine. This would affect the 1.1 billion that Dylan mentioned earlier. And we know that um, we have got data uh, from Reynolds and others showing what I thought was a missing piece of data, which they've now started filling, that the combustible user actually does switch in reasonably high numbers to smokeless products, be they snus and pouches. That is extremely good news because we thought from a behavioral point of view and from the habitual point of view, it would be unlikely you'd see large numbers willing to switch from a combustible hand-driven thing to something which you put in your mouth. Well, we were wrong. And with decent marketing and decent support and of the community and the user community, we could see that accelerate. That would be a huge win for public health. Third, I believe that um, the combination of vapes and pouches represent a huge opportunity, particularly for smokers who've now shifted to a vape and are finding that they are constrained in using their vape in the workplace or in an environment where it's either banned or restricted, using a nicotine pouch in combination, as we do with other pharmaceutical combination therapy, would give them the nicotine level that they need to keep them from ever starting again on a combustible cigarette. Fourthly, we've seen caffeine shifts shifted from being discouraged in youth. I can remember even in my, my childhood, um, I wasn't allowed to go and just have a cup of coffee as a kid or even as a teen, it was frowned upon. Well, today it's the commonest performance enhancer used widely, particularly by youth. Anybody wandering around Starbucks will get the story pretty quickly. The same rehabilitation of nicotine is needed, led by pouches. We know that on the, on the horizon is better brain performance, memory retention, and Parkinson's disease prevention. All of these, um, there are strong evidence from. The MIND study run out of Vanderbilt University, uh, following thousands of people, is looking at memory retention and Parkinson's prevention in very large numbers, and the early results are pretty good. When I speak to people involved in um, trading on Wall Street or trading around the world, there's an anecdotal buzz out there about people using nicotine pouches on the trading floor to enhance their ability to concentrate in a very uh, stressful environment. We need to break through the negativity that we've had to nicotine to see how many of these stories are true. And how could this actually open up new opportunities for better brain health and brain functioning? And finally, in an era when the environmental effects of consumer goods are under the spotlight, nicotine pouches offer a solution when derived from green chemistry, that's where how you get synthetic nicotine, which would cut greenhouse gas losses associated with tobacco across the growing cycle by very large numbers. It could cut the impurities associated with plant-derived nicotine 
and could cut back on the growing concerns about disposable vapes and the complex electronics that are finding themselves into our waste streams. So when I try to be critical and say, so what are the downsides? It's very difficult to think of downsides on the health side. And obviously there would be new additional environmental issues, which would be minor compared to what's out there. On the health ones, there would always be the concern about excess use, um, which occurs in every single product we consume, whether it's a food product or whether it's a pharmaceutical product, that would need to be controlled. We have to be concerned about traceability and we need to be able to ensure that you can trace where the nicotine comes from and that it's of a high quality. And you need common sense safety standards. But aside from that, I can't really think of any major concerns we should have about embracing nicotine pouches as a way to move ahead. What I think we need are some of the large scale studies to actually nail this down and give confidence both to consumers and regulators about the potential being achievable. Thank you. Thank you, David. Tremendous. Thank you very much, and uh, particularly, uh, Derek, for the precise way in which you've highlighted the benefits and the risks of this particular class of product. Um, what springs to mind first is your equivalence, the equivalence that you've made between oral nicotine pouches and nicotine replacement therapy, which has been the mainstay of public health and even medical uh, teaching is that the only way to quit is by using NRTs and psychotherapy. And from a risk uh, point of view, the equivalence to NRT is an important similarity. And you might have heard that this here first, but you might have picked up that Derek, Derek spoke about combination use. So we know that there's a fixation almost in public health that cessation is the only success metric for any use of tobacco. And Derek made a very good differentiation between combustibles and non-combustibles, such as oral nicotine. But please remember what he mentioned in terms of combination use. That in the real world, the consumer rarely goes from day to night, black to white, and switches off immediately from cigarette smoking, for instance. Uh, but it might also involve combination use of the existing product and then as they process out of that class. So remember the combination use, and I would encourage uh, Derek to write something on, on that as well, so that as this category and the knowledge of the category grows, that we can place that into the, the public and the scientific debate. Thank you very much, Derek. I would also at this point, just to uh, welcome our worldwide online audience and just explain what our approach was. The Oral Nicotine Commission is completely independent, but we subscribe absolutely, we subscribe to the UN's call in the UN statement on the prevention and control of non-communicable or chronic disease, where they call for a whole of society, whole of government approach, where they stand for multi-sector action, and they encourage uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue. So what we did with this online hybrid conference is to invite all stakeholders. And we are very welcoming of manufacturers, whether it's big companies, small companies, but we are especially welcoming uh, government officials from around the world. Uh, the consumers, very happy that Atakan is here. We feel that the, the, the consumers are generally treated as the orphans in this debate. So the consumer representatives are extremely important. And then the health professionals, so it's extremely important for us to have all the stakeholders on site. I'm also welcoming Professor Miaila Rescue, who will speak to us um, after, after Anders and Lars uh, and, and Carl, uh, and the other online speakers, Jose and, and Sully. So it is my privilege to introduce Carl Fagerstrom, who is a legend in tobacco control. Not many scientists have an eponymous a uh, test named after them. So what was first the, the Fagerstrom um, index for addiction is now the cigarette dependence index, the Fagerstrom index. And we are so we are so grateful, Carl, for your lifelong body of work, your honest and sincere way in which you've treated all of your colleagues and stakeholders over the years, and especially what you've done in Sweden. And that's really the second big spotlight of this event 
is Sweden as a world champion in tobacco control and harm reduction. So without further ado, I would well, like to welcome Paul to the, the stage for his talk. There we go. Dear Dylan, thank you very much for an excellent introduction. It's very difficult to live up to something like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, must hold it closer. So as a matter of fact, I won't be actually speaking so much about what I have done in particularly for Sweden, uh, but rather what uh, my research in this era more generally. And to all of you, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or, or good night, wherever you are. Here in Stockholm, there is almost good night every time of the, the uh, day, this time of the year. We have very little light. So anyway, I became interested in tobacco uh, and nicotine already in 1975. Uh, I was dealing with uh, drug addicts and they smoked and they taught me that smoking is as difficult as to give up for the illicit drugs, which I didn't believe. So I had to dive into it and found that they were very much right. And here I'm still interested in the area. But uh, let me begin my talk with uh, around 19... 95 or something like that. Um, uh, I am developing nicotine replacement products at a pharmaceutical company in the south of Sweden. The acceptability of our products is kind of mediocre. Uh, there is a low dose and despite the low dose, uh, consumers are complaining about side effects like aversive burning, etc. in the mouth. Uh, but uh, I am in Sweden, so I am in an environment where we have a product snooze, which is gaining access and attention. And the smoking prevalence is going down and snooze is used for smoking cessation and the most used smoking cessation aid. So then it shouldn't come as a surprise that with my background in developing nicotine replacement products registered by pharmaceutical agencies, why not do, do a snooze without tobacco, but pure nicotine, the same nicotine we put into the patches and gums. So that was my entrance to this. And in the next slide, I would like to show you what are the ingredients in these products? This is the first one to the left here. Sonic is the one that I was developing. Uh, we have in the middle the market leader, Sin. And to the right, we have a nicotine gum. The, uh, the screen is too light for the pointer. Anyway, the ingredients here, they are nicotine. Nicotine needs to have a carrier. Uh, there needs to be a a pH, which uh, gives rise to absorption of nicotine, not too much, not too slow, and there need to be flavors. So these are the four type of ingredients we have. And uh, in this uh, sonic product, we have microcrystalline cellulose, which we also have in the market leaders in and uh, similar carriers for the other pouches. For the gum, there is a gum base. But the ingredients are pretty much the same, even though the names are differing a little bit, but in terms of belonging to a chemical class and effects, they are similar. So the nicotine, what I want to the take home message here, that the ingredients with the nicotine pouches sold today by the tobacco industry as consumer products are very similar to the pharmaceutical nicotine replacement products. Then on this slide, we see a good number, 24 toxins listed. And we want to see what is the release of toxins from the nicotine replacement products, which you have here, and for the nicotine pouches products that we have here. In this case, the brand is Lyft. It's a busy slide. 
but I can tell you that there is really no difference in release between the two type of products. So again, the pouches uh, manufactured and marketed by the tobacco companies seem to be very similar to the nicotine replacement products. These products are not yet regulated in most markets, I think, and there are a number of things you would like to know before you make a good regulatory scheme. But I think what is most important is that the acceptable maximum level of nicotine to set a cap on that because there has been companies, old companies from countries, maybe also old countries that have come with very, very high amounts of nicotine, which we do not need. What we see from today's uh, products, that is that we have, a, this is the uh, different doses, three milligram, six milligram and eight milligram. So we have the three milligram, six milligram, eight milligram dose response. We have a snus product in red and the uh, green one is uh, Nicorette four milligram, which was not part of this study, but it's put in there from other data, just as a reference. And we see that at least the six and eight milligram rises up to 15 nanogram. You have a boost of 15 nanograms per milliliter, which is about what smokers get from smoking a cigarette in a normal way. Uh, if we go to another slide with more brands, we have a cigarette in this study that actually goes to top C max is 15 nanograms per mil. Also the nicotine pouches reaches up to a little bit over or below 15 nanograms. It takes a bit longer time, which uh, may be a little bit less set give a little bit less satisfaction, but also is less likely to be dependence producing and abuse. Yeah? The time you get to the CMAX is important when you get to dependence. So the strongest products here contains 10 milligram and the strongest product from the previous slide, eight milligram. And uh, where should the cap be at eight or 10 or 20 or 30 or 40? Uh, I think that around uh, in the Czech Republic, I think they very recently approved 12 milligram as uh, the maximum nicotine content. The German uh, uh, Risk Assessment Institute might recommend 16 milligram per pouch. And I think you certainly don't need more than that. A good product can do well with eight and 10 also. And uh, regarding harmfulness, we have this study by Merkit and all, where we see the relative risk hierarchy of 13 nicotine products. And it's relative to combustible cigarettes. And uh, as we see, when we get into a non-combustion here, we have a dramatic drop in risk and we get to nicotine pouches. We have a very, very small risk increase as estimated by this study uh, market. Of course, we don't know the real risk yet because we haven't had time to do epidemiology, which would be needed, but um, uh, to tie on to the title of my presentation was how does it save lives? I can at least say that there has been one mod modeling study published where some assumption has been made on reasonable use of pouches in the United States. And if they had been introduced at year 2000, what would the outcome has been? And the outcome and prediction in this study was that there would be several hundred thousand deaths avoided or, or rather postponed. Uh, avoided is difficult, I suppose. Uh, the German Risk Assessment Institute, Bundesverband für Risikobewertigung, 
has just released a report that I would like to quote a few sentences from. Cigarette smokers who start using snus are more likely to quit cigarettes. It is not yet possible to estimate whether a similar situation exists with nicotine pouches, though. Agreed, but seems likely the similarity between the products. With regard to tobacco-induced diseases, Sweden has a special position in Europe. An evaluation of cancer incidences and mortality rates in Europe in 2012 showed that Sweden was the only country in Europe where lung cancer was not at the top of cancer mortality rates in men. Age-standardized cancer incidences were also calculated in the study. Among men, Sweden had the lowest value for lung cancer among the 40 countries in Europe investigated. And the uh, actual rate was 29 per 100,000. In comparison, German had an incidence of 27 per 100,000, twice as high as in Sweden. 57, sorry, 57 per 100,000, which is double that of, of Sweden. So there are many issues to be discussed here. Uh, Derek Jach brought up some of them. Uh, I provide two more here. Is a drug-free world a realistic goal? I mean, if it is a realistic goal, I don't think we need to develop any products with less harm, actually. It may actually then make the, the drug that we that some dislike to stay longer than necessary. But uh, in my life so far, I don't see that there are very good odds for a non, uh, for a drug-free world, even with the illicit drugs and the war on drugs, et cetera, to what success. And it's also worth noting, although it's a little bit outside the topic of what I'm asked to talk about today, but in the US, we certainly have seen tobacco go down. But at the very same time, we have seen cannabis go up. And today in US, there are more adults using cannabis than tobacco. I cannot say it's a causal effect, but I don't rule out that there is a communicating yard. And then it's a matter of would we prefer snus or a nicotine pouch rather than cannabis and see this uh, marijuana. Okay, another long-term use of nicotine replacement products is allowed today by many authorities. And how should the nicotine pouches be regulated if they are close to NRTs in their tox toxicity profile? And um, further here, Dr. Jach brought it up already, comparing nicotine with other substances. Uh, alcohol is for sure a lot more harmful and has more costs to the society than would nicotine pouches and snus. And um, certainly also if we compare with cannabis uh, and tetrahydrocannabinol, hydrocannabinol, there is less there is less worries about psychotoxicity and operating uh, possible uh, dangerous machinery, etc. That diagnosis does simply doesn't exist for nicotine, uh, the side effects of sedation, etc. So I think that nicotine is coming closer and closer to caffeine. There is one area where nicotine definitely should not be used, like caffeine in high amounts, and that is pregnancy. But apart from that, Nicotine and pregnancy may not be that far apart on the harmful scale continuum. Thank you very much. That was all I had to say today. Thank you, Carl. What a pleasure to uh, hear Carl speak as one of the first developers of an all nicotine pouch, the Sonic. Um, it is now my privilege to introduce. Anders Milton, Lars, if that's okay with you. Uh, I will. I would like to introduce Anders Milton to the discussion. Now, Anders is one of Sweden's most effective ambassadors. 
and in my book, he should have been prime minister long ago. But Anders has been the president of the Swedish Red Cross. He was the president of the Swedish Medical Association. He was then the chairman of the World Medical Association. He was my boss, a very benevolent dictator, I have to say. And uh, Anders, <laughs> Anders has been a lifelong health advocate. So from this perspective, we asked him to talk about the role of Sweden and the role of oral nicotine pouches in Sweden and global health. Thank you, Anders. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, the, the reason I started with, with tobacco and harm reduction is really that I'm against premature deaths. I mean, we, we shouldn't let people die just because they have bad habits. If we can save them, we should. It's as simple as that. And, and uh, I was asked by, you know, the, uh, the producers of Snus in Sweden to, to chair the Snus Commission. And I said, I have two requirements. First of all, that I choose my, the people I want to work with. And secondly, that the people that pay are not going to have any influence whatsoever in what we study, what we publish. And they said, yes, yes. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. And the reason I did that was that the same way as a, as as an investigator for the Swedish government, one of them, I I, I suggested that we should have uh, exchanges of needles and syringes for intravenous drug abuse, not because I'm a liberal when it comes to drugs, illicit drugs, but because nobody that uses drugs will stop will start using drugs because they're free needles and syringes. And nobody who is a drug user will stop using drugs because they don't have clean needles and syringes. I mean, it's simple, they will die from that. And the same way when I was president of the Swedish Red Cross, when I was working in, you know, Swedish Red Cross work in many countries. I was in Southern Africa, you know, to, to, spoken, speaking to the 10 southernmost Red Cross societies. And we talked about sexual and reproductive health. Now the question is, should we, should we tell kids about sexual and reproductive health? Well, you know, they'll start anyway. And it's better that they understand, you know, the, the, the problems of pregnancy, the problems of intravenous, of, the, of, of, of infections, and how you get away from that. You have to start, not that we as parents want our kids to start early, but we need to tell them what it's all about. If we don't do that, they will, they will go wrong, unfortunately. And in those days, I mean, 20, some 20 years ago, in, in parts of South Africa or in Kenya, you had 20% of the women, of the girls in, in, a, in, a, in a gymnasium being infected with HIV and AIDS. I mean, 20% because they had relationships with the boys that were 30 and they were 15 themselves. Now, we have to, we have to, to do things that we affect behaviors that we don't particularly like we need to do that and and the, the same with harm reduction on tobacco i don't use snooze i don't use cigarettes i do smoke an occasional cigar the question is what what do we do why is it so difficult for for the swedish government for example the swedish health authorities to talk about harm reduction because everybody wants everybody you know they, they want everybody to stop smoking and as we heard earlier from derek here we have 1.1 or tell them perhaps 1.1 billion smokers in the world. Half of them would die from smoking. And, you know, with, with the Swedish experiment, as it were, you know, we have, we have the lowest incidence of, of smoking in, the, in, in, in Europe. We have the lowest incidence of lung cancer in Europe. Not because people, in, men in Sweden do not use nicotine daily, but because they use oral pouches instead of, of smoking cigarettes. It's that, that saves their lives. And we should, we should act upon that. And we should try to get the authorities, as it were, the health authorities, not least the World Health Organization, to understand the need for a change of behavior on, on the part of the, of the authorities. We want the, uh, the government to, to, to tell people the true story. We don't want fake news, as it were. We want the, the governments to tell this, the people that, that oral pouches 
can save lives. And that we have the example of Sweden, for example, where, where we see that this actually does work. And we think that it's important that, that the authorities accept the fact that and accept accept science and, and, and the science that you don't get cancer from from pouches. You can live with your pouch, but you will die from smoking. And I think it's important that we try to get that message across. It will be an uphill fight, I tell you that. It will be an uphill fight because all the activists, the good people as it were, are on the other side. And we have to convince them that being on the, the good side, as it were, doesn't save lives. It destroys lives. And we want to save people's lives. And that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. If you, you can keep that with you. Thank you. Uh, Anders, thank you very much indeed. And it is interesting that your work in harm reduction has spanned HIV AIDS as well. Later on, we'll have Dr. Kossi Detlape, who has the same journey, where harm reduction has saved many hundreds of thousands of lives. Our next speaker is uh, Lars Ramstrom. I just want to make sure that he's ready to speak. I just want to also make, make sure, is Soli Ratemane and Kossi Detlape online already? Mihaila is? Fine. Fine. Yes, we are. Thank you, Jose. Yes, um, I am, of course. Hello, <laughs> Miaila. Hello. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, welcome <laughs> Professor Miaila Rescu uh, to coming. Miaila Rescu to our our speakers, but first, just Lars Ramstrom. So, Lars, if I can introduce Lars as one of the legends of tobacco control. Uh, just a short biography of this amazing person. Uh, so Lars has been involved in research in tobacco control and uh, specifically SNUS as well for the last 52 years. Derek mentioned perhaps that uh, we, we had him sign a document which he was a co-author of with the World Health Organization back in 1970. Uh, he was also the director of the Swedish National Cessation Association, and it gives me tremendous uh, pleasure, Lars, to ask you to speak to us about especially the role of oral nicotine pouches and snus in the saving of lives in Sweden, please. Just remember to keep it close to your mouth. Thank you, Dylan, for this lovely presentation. And let me express my delight to be here among friends and colleagues that have played in very important roles in the promotion of harm reduction and reduction of tobacco related diseases. When we speak about saving of lives from being lost by tobacco diseases. The key issue is bringing down smoking rates. And let me therefore start by looking at what we have achieved in Sweden. Prevalence of daily tobacco use in Sweden uh, looks very much like this. And looking first at smoking, male rates have had a dramatic decrease from 49% in 1963 down to the current 5% that we have heard mentioned already. The female rates have not decreased that much at all. And they have started going down in a notable way, just the very last uh, periods. So there is something different between development in males 
and development in females. And let me come back to that a little bit later. And for SNILS rates, there is also a striking difference between the sexes. Uh, for males, there has been a dramatic up going trend uh, in the earliest years in this period, while it has leveled off in, in the last uh, periods, obviously because of unsuitable governmental policies in terms of increasing snus taxation much more than increasing cigarette taxation and altogether showing a very reluctant policy against snus. Uh, for example, the National Board of Health just explicitly denies that uh, snus has played a major role uh, and the National Board of Health equally denies the existence in the framework convention of an option for uh, harm reduction. They have even falsified the official Swedish translation of that paragraph of, uh, of the framework convention. Uh, so that is part of the background in spite of which we have reached these quite, uh, I would say, good results. Then, oh, oh, that's a, then we should see what corresponds to these uh, habit data in terms of uh, rates uh, for uh, deaths attributable to tobacco use in Sweden. And again, we see a difference between uh, the genders. Male rates have dropped uh, in this uh, 12 year period very strikingly from 99 to 72 percent, while female rates uh, started much lower and ends uh, not very much lower than they started in 2006. Uh, so I think this corresponds. Uh, quite definitely to uh, the development in terms of uh, snus use and cigarette use. We have data from the Global Burden of Disease Study uh, showing uh, international data on the death rates. And as you see from this map, uh, there are enormous, enormous differences uh, with the top uh, in certain Eastern countries and the lowest uh, death rates in Sweden and Norway, uh, and I will come back to the comparison there. The difference between Sweden 72 uh, and the top uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, is very striking indeed. Oh. Excuse me. These differences uh, do, to some extent, uh, refer to differences in implementation of the officially uh, recognized recommendations by WHO uh, and others. And there is a special uh, project uh, which uh, investigates data on the implementation of the, tobacco, the, of, uh, the official uh, means for tobacco control. 
this TCS scale, tobacco control scale. And what is published by the tobacco control scale project itself is just what differences there are between uh, different countries. And, and again, we have large differences between countries. Uh, the best level uh, is found in uh, Great Britain uh, and the worst uh, in Germany, while Sweden has an intermediate position in this respect. And so we should ask what does this, these differences in implementation level, what do they mean in terms of deference? That is exactly what I have been specifically investigating in the recent study of mine, where I have plotted on the horizontal scale the TCS score for level of implementation and on the vertical scale the death rates as published by the global burden of disease study and so we see here how Sweden and Norway stand out at the bottom of the death rate scale while we see that the trend line is rather has low slope and the determination coefficient is quite low, telling us that just 11% of the variation is explained by the differences in implementation levels. But they have some influences although as I say a low one and what's interesting here is particularly I would say that we can compare Sweden to other countries with similar level of implementation so if we compare uh, this we find that Sweden had uh, death rates of 72 the European average would uh, be, as you see from reading the trend line, something like 160, uh, much higher. And that is keeping the implementation level constant. We could uh, see what other factors mean for the difference between Sweden and the European Union countries. That is, this level is what we could expect uh, to be the actual one in Sweden if we, we had uh, not what comes as option number one, the use of SNPs. So therefore we have to put special attention to the uh, hypothesis that SNIVS is the major uh, explanation why Sweden has this level, not this one, which would be a probable hypothesis. But uh, there are strong uh, questions uh, about the role of SNPs uh, for the key issue, the smoking rates. So for example, there are many people who strongly advocate uh, that those who start uh, tobacco use by uh, SNPs, they will have a gateway effect so that they do more easily start daily smoking. 
but here we see from a study of mine and co-workers that in those without uh, yes uh, how, how shall we read it in those without initial daily news use we have much higher rates of initiation of smoking than in those with initial daily news use. So these data strongly advocate against news being a gateway to smoking. So as many people quite honestly believe, that is one of the misunderstandings that has have to be corrected. The other key issue is the interaction between snooze use and cessation of smoking. And here we see that among those who had uh, an initial uh, smoking and no uptake of snooze use, we had around 40% continuing smoking while a much higher percent quit smoking. And among those, a quite substantial proportion later uh, were quitting uh, snooze use as well, which is interesting from a special point of view because one of the misunderstandings that is strongly propagated by certain people, they say that, okay, if you switch from uh, smoking to snooze, you keep the exposure to nicotine and uh, that, that doesn't uh, be very much of a uh, benefit. So, so many people uh, hesitate about switching because they fear that uh, they are just at the same risk because they keep uh, the nicotine exposure. And so it's very important to know that, first of all, switching to snooze is no guarantee of lifetime nicotine exposure and nicotine dependence. A large proportion does actually uh, leave the nicotine dependence even in that situation. So, uh, in summary, uh, SNPs uh, is actually something that favors smoking cessation. So there are double benefits of, of SNPs use in combination with uh, the tobacco habits. It both uh, decreases initiation of smoking and increases cessation of smoking. So, in an attempt to estimate the number of lives saved by this, I have noticed that we had 72 uh, deaths per 100,000 in Sweden and 160 uh, in e EU with similar TCS score. And uh, looking at the male population in Sweden, uh, 5.261 million people, we could estimate the hypothetical number of tobacco related deaths in the absence of SNPs, uh, that is, uh, supposing the uh, EU average level being applied to Sweden, and compare that to the actual number of tobacco-related deaths as calculated by the uh, Global Burden of Disease Study. And that ends up with a difference of 
4,630 uh, male lives, male lives saved by snus in Sweden in 2019. This is no uh, exact calculation, uh, but it is a reasonable indication of the order of magnitude uh, that is uh, probably valid here. Uh, we still uh, lack data for females because we have already seen that the corresponding female data would be much lower and hopefully coming later on. Uh, but today the data are not uh, allowing the similar kind of, of calculation for females. But this is what could be done for today, I think. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lars, uh, for giving us a summary of SNUS. Now, just to be clear, SNUS is a precursor and a tobacco product used in, in Sweden, but a precursor of this oral nicotine pouch category. <laughs> and if this is the effect that Lars has so uh, wisely demonstrated, no gateway effect, the fact that they are lives saved because of SNUS in, in Sweden, and it also explains the low smoking prevalence. Lars, thank you very much. And please uh, accept our deepest respect for your life work, for the fact that at your age, you can still take us through all the numbers and that you come up with new hypotheses. So we long may that last and we, we see you as a treasure in, in our community. Anders. No, I just want to say that if, if you take the, the other numbers, rather than say how many lives will be saved each year in the European Union if they smoked and you snooze like in Sweden. It's about 350,000 per year. Yeah, I made a calculation of exactly that uh, a few years ago. And I think, I, if I remember correctly, uh, it ended up by something like uh, 300,000. Yeah, it's 350,000. Yeah. May I also tell you, I, I was in Norway meeting the, the social committee of, of Norwegian Parliament. And I was giving a, a, a talk, and, and there was also people talking, the, the minister first, of course, and the, the Cancer Foundation in Norway. And they said that there are 6,000 people dying from lung cancer in Norway each year. So I, I sat there waiting. So I looked on my phone, and I looked up to the Swedish numbers. Now, how many die in Sweden? We have a population that is 90% larger than the Norwegian one. How many people do die from lung cancer in Sweden each year? 5.2 thousand. So actually we would have 11,000 really if we had Norwegian figures, but we have 5,000. We have half the number of deaths as Norway has. And they have started, they have started snooze fairly recently. We've used it for a longer time. But this, the amount of, of men using nicotine each day is about the same. So you see that even, even if you compare two countries close to each other with similar backgrounds, there's a great difference in cancer related to, to, to snooze and cigarettes. Thank you, Anders. On this note, we'd like to welcome uh, Professor Miala Rescu of Romania, who is a professor of oral health and dentistry. And we ask uh, Mihaila to expand. Hello, Mihaila. We've asked Hello. Mihaila to expand on the role of uh, oral health and the potential of uh, oral nicotine pouches uh, and this less harmful product in oral health. Mihaila, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> and um, thank you, Dylan. And thank you for inviting me to this interesting conference uh, with such prestigious speakers. And uh, for me, as a professor in oral health prevention, this is a great opportunity to discuss about, um, about a product that has the potential to switch a large number of smokers away from smoking. 
Um, I recognize that I've conducted researches, uh, some research in uh, the last few years regarding um, the oral health effects when cigarette smokers are switching to heat nut burn products. So I am, um, I can say that I am aware of their benefits in uh, oral hygiene and oral health. I have also, um, I have also admit that um, the nicotine pouches are not so used in Romania. And uh, I'm sure that most of the Romanian smokers don't have the idea of such an alternative with nicotine, but without tobacco leaf, which is such a big difference from other products. Um, <clears throat> about oral health, oral health means health for entire body. So the oral mucosa is designed to facilitate the protection and also the absorption of the substances in contact with saliva. That, that means that good and bad substances will be easily absorbed directly into the blood and transported to the organs. Uh, for smokers, for example, the first impact to smoke is the oral cavity. And despite, the halito despite of halitosis, all the cigarette smokers are experiencing um, oral health problems. I remember I showed my students some images featuring a, a smoker tongue and it was like a rumor um, appeared in the room. And immediately somebody said, okay, who wants to kiss a smoker? <laughs> so always, but always after such a course and such images, um, all the students are saying, okay, I will stop st smoking starting from tomorrow. But usually, <clears throat> let's face it, it's... Um, um, Wanting something and getting something, there are two different things. Big difference between one, one and another. So the advice is good, but it is not always enough. So what can we do to, to change all what's happening? I mean, in the medical field, in the medical field, I think smoke, I mean, it's well known that smoking it's recognized like a risk factor for many dangerous diseases. In the same times, as a paradox, in Romania, we have a lot of doctors, um, cigarette smokers, and a lot of medical students, cigarette smokers. So I think uh, we have two issues here. First, they themselves, they, don't, they are not aware of tobacco harm reduction possibilities. Uh, and for sure, they are not aware about the, existing, uh, the existence of nicotine pouches. This is something um, quite, uh, sure, I'm quite sure of it. And second, the reduction in harm uh, means that the tobacco user is willing to switch to another product, I mean, to switch the, the cigarette to another product. That means he will be uh, interested to be informed about the tobacco harm reduction possibilities. So if you are not willing, really willing to, to get rid, I mean, to quit smoking, you are not interested in uh, some other possibilities, I mean, some other alternatives. Um, and now in the light of uh, what I was saying, the nicotine pouches might be a solution uh, because uh, there are some products without combustion, without tobacco inside, so with less toxicants, with no inhalation, but they have nicotine, um, and the nicotine is good for feeding the smokers' brain necessities. So this is something that we have to balance the, the good and the bad things uh, in this product. Um, I studied the literature, and I concluded that there are very, very few stu studies regarding the use of oral nicotine pouches and their impact on oral health. And uh, most of the articles are related to uh, the oral mucosa transformation. I saw also comparative studies regarding the oral effects when the subjects were using snus and when they are using oral nicotine pouches. And now uh, I have this opportunity to congratulate the Swedish people for having uh, such a small rate of cigarette smokers. And we have to learn from them. We have to um, uh, to ask them uh, the about the, their strategy, and I don't know if they have had in their teams medical support. 
Um, I think it, it might be a good idea to enhance the awareness about tobacco harm reduction possibilities among physicians and dentists, because uh, as Derek says uh, before, maybe they are not exactly involved in their, I mean, exactly with in a big amount, I mean, big number. So the real problem, in my opinion, is that even these professionals from different medical fields are not informed about these are all the alternatives. Usually they are taking all the information from scientific articles and from some conferences. And um, um, only after that, they are uh, willing to communicate because they consider themselves more informed. So in, we have to research more and publish more about oral nicotine pouches. And the results are, are always a good argument for um, the people who want more explanation. That in um, um, our main priority in the immediate future must be to research the impact of this new product, nicotine pouches, on health, including oral health. Then to communicate and to use the results. And this is, I think, the way to motivate everyone in the medical field to accelerate the use of the product and maybe to accelerate cessation. Um, we may start with the oral health. And we may start with this because simply because uh, the dentists are directly involved with, um, um, I mean, in observing first oral mucosa, mucosa changes. And um, we all have a dentist in our lives. We need a dentist in our lives. And uh, uh, a doctor advice is more powerful and better received by the patient. And um, I think uh, in the end, um, we don't have to demonize all the innovations. I mean, first we have studied them and uh, after we have a conclusion, then we have to use them and uh, to take care to um, leave them on the health side of um, our, I mean, of our life. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say. And uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you have some other questions, please. <clears throat> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, And we will have uh, an Apple chance to entertain online questions, questions from our audience. But we are extremely grateful for you uh, highlighting the importance of oral health, especially against the background of the latest report by the WHO on oral health for the next decade. So this category uh, is a very timely reminder to WHO and, and global health uh, that it can help to lessen the oral health disease burden as well as premature death due to oral cancers. Thank you, Mayla. Thank you. Another extremely important part of population health, but also of individual health, is mental health. And this is also one of the orphans in the discussion. And we are extremely grateful to have Professor Solomon Rataimane uh, with us. Now, Professor Soli is an extremely well-respected and liked psychiatrist in South Africa. He headed his psychiatry unit in his university. He has been a longtime advisor to the Ministry of Health in South Africa and has played a very important role globally as well as the Secretary General of the World Association of Psychosocial Rehabilitation. Soli has a specific interest in how oral uh, or, or mental health patients have an issue that they have a higher, much higher smoking prevalence. And we asked him to give us his insights into what benefit, benefit this oral health and mental health could have uh, in against the background of oral nicotine pouches. Solly, are you with us? There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dylan. And uh, I'd like to thank Derek and uh, Lance for the very extensive uh, coverage of the area that they've given us, and also our colleague from Romania. Um, I think what is essential for me in terms of this discourse is that it seems as though fundamental to the progress of making governments understand 
that there is need for intervention, uh, there's need to recognize that uh, the alternatives to combustible uh, cigarettes, uh, there must be more and more education. And I, I know that uh, Dr. Kosilitab will expand more on that. Uh, in the mental health population, we are still struck by the fact that uh, many, many uh, patients, you know, want to smoke, particularly if they're in the psychotic state, particularly schizophrenics, uh, followed by those with, uh, who live with bipolar mood disorder. And, and when they're, they're given some cigarette, whether it's just cheap cigarette and so on, they seem to be better, they respond better to uh, instructions from the nurses. We, we, we're not just sure uh, whether this is identified as, a, as an issue. We know that there are hospitals in the UK where uh, there are times when patients are allowed to smoke and also uh, various alternatives like vaping have been introduced to some hospitals with great success. Now, most people really smoke because uh, they have a, a need to get the effect of nicotine to reduce the anxiety state. But we also find that there are many patients, there are many people who are not necessarily patients who are depressed, but when they smoke, they feel a little better. There are people with headaches and uh, generalized body pains who feel better when they smoke. Now, but what seems to be the key problem is that we cannot control uh, people's behavior. If they feel something makes them feel better, uh, why don't we then um, encourage governments to understand that uh, this is how these people you know, approach life and that's what they want to do uh, and allow them to do uh, to smoke, but in a safer way, because all we really, well, all they really want is a form of uh, safe delivery of nicotine. And, and the alternatives that have been discussed are, are very important. Uh, I'm at a tourism meeting in Barcelona and last night I interviewed uh, two young guys from uh, Sweden. Uh, they are between the age ranges 25 and 30. And they said they, they feel great. They were not, they didn't use snooze because they were persuaded by anybody. They never used combustible cigarettes at all. And they feel good. They can join their friends who use combustible cigarettes, but they're also, you know, significantly pointed out the use of combustible cigarettes has decreased remarkably in, uh, in, in, in Sweden. And people have noticed uh, the impact on their general health. For instance, uh, chronic lung diseases are decreasing, those which are related to smoking. So, so they see the health benefits. And so the persuasion was not because they were sick, but they just like to have the nicotine effect. So I think we have to develop a strategy of uh, talking to governments to, to at least consider the alternatives, analyze the people with uh, chronic mobility who are in hospitals, because uh, that, that really is uh, costing governments a lot of money. Um, I'm not so sure how we're going to carry through that message. Uh, what also appears to be very clear is that uh, there is no understanding of the effects of nicotine on the brain. Um, I mean, nicotine is a stimulant, you know, does help some people. There are other medications that are prescribed for as form of stimulants, and nicotine seems to play that role. I think the question that the uh, governments are asking is, uh, is there a way we can ask, assist people to stop smoking without using these alternatives? But when you look at South Africa and many African countries, we, we don't have many of the so-called uh, smoking cessation clinics. Um, you may find that help is available through individual psychotherapies, uh, through individual uh, therapy from psychiatrists and other people who are counselors at addiction facilities. So in summary, from my point of view, three important issues. One is education, education and presentation of scientific evidence to governments. Secondly, uh, going out in an advocacy you know, a pro, uh, program to educate people about the effects of smoking and also indicating what the possibilities are. I think the third aspect is that uh, we cannot um, completely dismiss the fact that uh, there is concern about the side effects that may come with the um, alternative products, you know, heat not burn, um, vaping equipment and so on. I think we have to look at that closely. You know, it seems as though many scientists are saying these alternatives work, but uh, uh, the skeptics 
a hammering on the, the possible side effects of these instruments. Uh, I think that's where education should be, and there must be more research in terms of uh, uh, the effect of smoking, not just on the brain, but also on cardiovascular system, and also um, uh, on the lungs. I think there's ample evidence so far, particularly the presentation that was made by Derek and also Lars, to the fact that, uh, you know, you could help so many people. They may still have lung problems or cardiovascular problems, but those will not be related to, to smoking. Dylan, let me stop there, and uh, I'll, I'll appreciate participation in uh, answering some of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Soli. Uh, much appreciated, and also pointing out the importance of including this in psychiatric and mental health uh, practice worldwide. We now have um, Dr. Josidet Lape. Now, I, I need to tell you a story that in 1954, when one of the most important publications by Dr. Richard Dole uh, was published in, in the Lancet, or in the, the British Medical Journal. And in this, he showed the relationship between smoking in doctors and lung cancer. And that essentially was the start of tobacco control with the doctors, health professionals of the world, understanding a risk and then leaving that risk alone. And we often, we often have seen that that physicians are first in and first out. So health professionals play a disproportionately important role in how they advise their patients. Now we are privileged to have Dr. Josilet Lape. He's the uh, former president of the World Medical Association, of the South African Medical Association, also the former president of ANCUA, who's the African Alliance of Regulators uh, for the continent and uh, for its health professionals. And Josi has had a deep and long career in health diplomacy with health professionals. Now, Josi, we'd like to ask you what role health professionals can play, especially with regard to oral nicotine pouches. Thank you for being with us on the panel. Uh, thank you, Dylan, and thank you to the organizers for, for the invitation. I, I guess maybe I may sound a bit disillusioned at this point in time. But my summary would be that we can't really count on healthcare professionals on this matter. It's not that they should not be educated, but our performance in relation to smoking is dismal. If you look at what's happened in, in the UK, at the recent GTNF conference, a member of parliament reported the fact that despite the use of vaping in the national health system, more than 50% of the GPs in the UK still think that vaping is as harmful, if not more harmful, than combustible cigarettes. So there's something much deeper inside the healthcare professionals. You know, having been bombarded with the fact that uh, the only thing you can do for a smoker is get them to quit or inform them that if they don't quit, they will die. And that's the sum total of the education of most healthcare professionals. You then have to juxtapose that with the fact that there's a lot of respected scientists in the health community that are anti-harm reduction in relation to tobacco. They are pro-harm reduction in other aspects. They are pro-harm reduction in HIV and AIDS, in terms of the use of condoms, needle exchanges in terms of drug addicts. But when it comes to tobacco, there seems to be a blind spot. And I think there's a lot of harm that happened in the 60s between the intense battle between public health and the industry. And unfortunately, the industry finds therapy in the more profits they make, but we have not been able to assist the public health professionals in terms of overcoming that hostility to see that there are other products which are not the same as combustible cigarettes. I mean, the key issue is about differentiation. And I battle trying to speak to professionals about the fact that these products are different. And when you look at the legislative framework that is being put out in South Africa in terms of the tobacco bill, there is absolutely no di differentiation up front, and there's differentiation at the back. So it's a difficult battle to get 
healthcare professionals to come along. What helps is when people see evidence of clinical studies that have come out uh, that show that when people switch, their health improves. When they move from non-combustibles, their health improves. So we still need to produce more of those clinical studies as has been produced in Italy. Uh, so so, so, so it, it, it's, it's a real difficult challenge. But going back to what we know, what happened in HIV and AIDS, it was absolutely no different in HIV and AIDS. We ended up with a situation where, in HIV and AIDS where the patients knew more about what is possible, ARVs, than their average doctor, both GPs and specialists. And the battle was won because the patients were informed and the patients went to seek their rights and they fought for that. So we shouldn't just concentrate on educating physicians, not that we should stop. But more importantly, we should mobilize the public and mobilize society. I mean, I, I've just been looking at our news where somebody started a fire outside and there's been tremendous de damage in the neighborhood. Possible source, a combustible cigarette. So those issues we do not talk about. So we need to be talking about the benefits of moving away from combustion in its broadness, the lack of smell in homes, the reduction of fires. So the benefits are not just to the user. There are also benefits to society, the reduction of secondhand smoke, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Dillon, it's important to educate healthcare professionals. And we must also look beyond just traditional medical doctors, but all healthcare professionals, particularly in Africa, where the number of doctors is much less than the number of other healthcare professionals, even traditional healers. So, so we need to look at all people that are consulted by the population in terms of their health needs and not just look at the professionals. So I will be embarking on trying to get healthcare professionals that smoke to try and find out why they smoke, why they not switching. And that might be a group to cultivate. Where, as you've said, Dilo, the number of healthcare professionals that smoke is greatly reduced, but we still have a significant number that have not stopped. Why have they not stopped? How can we help them? So that we concentrate on the people that continue smoking, that can switch, knowing the harmful effects of combustible cigarettes. Now, now, now just shortly, I like oral nicotine products for a couple of reasons. One, in Africa, there's an affinity to smoke less tobacco. So we could then try and cultivate that to say, put it in a pouch, it is less harmful. But secondly, cost, access, you don't need to charge a device and environmental sustainability. So those issues are important issues to promote oral nicotine products. But let's remember this, we need to give people a choice. Because if, if uh, the patch and the gum was the alternative, people would have switched. There are preferences. So we need to ensure that people are well informed, people are educated, people know about the risk continuum, and they are allowed to make informed choices. We should not decide for people. So what is critical for Africa? is to ensure that we have a legislative framework that understands that not all smokes are the same. The continuum of risk, differentiation, and more importantly, ensuring that the alternatives are available to smokers. Now there's issues of access, issues of pricing, where some of the electronic devices are not generally accessible because of cost to ordinary people. And we see that in our societies, the poor people smoke more than the affluent people. So we still need to ensure that alternatives are available to them. Lastly, Dillon, I think part of the issue about educating the healthcare professionals 
is about educating them about their responsibility to patients, their responsibility to be truthful, and that they cannot be followers. If they don't know enough, they should tell the patient, I do not know. One of the challenges is that smokers have been demonized. I mean, it was interesting to listen to Anders in his opening speech talking about bad habits. And that's the problem. Smokers are sinners. These are bad habits. We should be talking about habits, not necessarily bad habits, because when you say bad habits, it becomes a judgment issue. Even smokers are not empowered to say, I've made a choice. They are seen as sinners. So we need to come up with a campaign where, as I've learned at the GTNF, that we no longer talk about them as smokers, but we talk about them as people who smoke. Because once you begin to describe them as people who smoke, we bring about the fact that they are human as well, they have rights, and they have a right to be treated properly by healthcare professionals, to be given credible information based on science, based on evidence, not based on a history of how somebody lied in the past and how others were hurt and how people suffer now because that issue was not resolved. And lastly, as was said in the beginning by Derek, evidence exists. Let's look at what has happened with the FDA approving ICOS, approving SNUS, approving a vape product as reduced exposure to harm. And let's ensure that common sense is not relegated to the back and that we do not want evidence where common sense should prevail. Thank you, Dilo. Thank you so much, Hossi. <clears throat> As always, uh, a very incisive set of comments and putting into context the role of health professionals. Hossi did also, he, he did a great job actually of helping to introduce the consumer voice. So we're now going into our panel discussion and what our one panelist that will join us is Joe Maguero, who is the chairman of the Campaign for Safe Alternatives in Kenya. Uh, Joe, are you online? Yes. Yes, I am. So, um, Joe, you might have heard Hossi speaking about the three A's for consumers, that these products should be affordable, that they should be accessible, and that they should also be acceptable. And he spoke about the ethical duty of health professionals to provide honest information to consumers. And he also spoke about the human rights of those consumers and people who smoke, people who use snus, people who use oral nicotine pouches, their human rights in order to have access to information and accurate information about its risk and its use. So we'd like to ask Joe for a quick five minute introduction of what's happening in Kenya. And then we will have an open session. So if you have any questions, please just put it into the chat box and we will have our panelists respond. Joe, please, Joe Maguero. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. And I hope everybody can hear me. Good evening. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Joseph Maguero, as you've heard. I'm the chairman for um, Campaign for Safe Alternatives where we push for affordable options for um, cessation products to be made available to smokers in Africa who cannot quit or who are unable to quit. Uh, the reason why I believe that uh, nicotine pouches are the most effective tool in tobacco control is, first of all, the issue of familiarity. Uh, most smokers or people who use tobacco in Africa are familiar with oral products. They know how it works and they know how to place them in the mouth. And the second factor is the issue of affordability. You must understand that um, a product such as a, a, a nicotine or nicotine gums, they cost about $38, which for that is not affordable for most of smokers in Africa, seeing as uh, poor people here in Africa smoke than uh, the affluent people. And so for example, here in Kenya, we did a, a survey 
earlier this year, people who use nicotine pouches. Fortunately, Kenya is a country that uh, has those products available here for the time being. And we found that 69% of people in our survey used nicotine pouches in place of traditional cigarettes. That means that they understand the problem is really not in, in the nicotine, but in combustion. And we're seeing the products thrive in the market. So my, my recommendation as an advocate would be to give smokers enough information and equipment, equipment, equip them with knowledge of, of, of the differences between traditional cigarettes and nicotine pouches. I myself, uh, I use nicotine pouches to date. I stopped using electronic cigarettes <laughs> because they work better for me and they're discreet. So that's all I will say for now, Diva. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, now it's my pleasure to ask there some questions online. And I, I also would like to give Derek a chance. There's one specific intervention. Jessica Perkins is my co-moderator and she will bring us some of the questions. But Derek first, please. Great, thank you. Um, really rich discussion. I'll be very brief and um, I'll, I'll actually also be um, pushing some people to go a little bit further. Um, first to uh, Mihaela. Um, you know, when I look at the oral cancer death rates, what is really curious and very rarely spoken about is that the oral cancer death rates in Romania, Hungary and India, as well as Bangladesh, are almost identical. Romania, Hungary, India, and Bangladesh. Why? And what can we be doing at a large scale to intervene? Clearly, um, there's something which has never really been fully understood about Hungary and Romania, but the data have been out there for 15 years um, that we've known. These are extremely high rates, um, and we've always known about India. But I raise it because um, I don't hope we go down a rabbit hole of uh, discovery, but we go down a role of let's intervene. Let's see whether those countries with um, four or five of the highest death rates in the world and a European-Indian partnership might be the way to accelerate progress. Secondly, um, Sally, so thrilled to, to have you talk about um, the importance of addressing patients with mental health and uh, and you refer to what I assume is the Priory Hospital Group in the UK, um, where uh, Pooja <laughs> Patwadan and uh, Sud are, have been involved in um, bringing e-cigarettes to dispensing machines and mental institutions, and an extensive training program um, involving psychiatrists and uh, mental health program people. I really think that's ripe for expanding. And I think the question we need to think about, really two questions is, um, how will profoundly um, uh, mentally disturbed patients, particularly with schizophrenia and with bipolar, um, how do they react to the use of oral products? Do we know? And secondly, what are the pharmacodynamics uh, involved in using nicotine? Because there's always been a belief that if you can keep the nicotine levels reasonably high, you could drop the level of antipsychotics and other very serious um, uh, mental health drugs, leaving the patient in a much better state of requiring less anti less pharmaceutical product um, with enormous implications. Love your thoughts of that. And then finally, um, um, uh, and I think uh, Horsey was raising it, it's one of my crazy ideas when I first um, saw the progress being happening in Japan uh, in ICOS stores, and they were successfully moving people to switch. This was literally at the start of the Japanese experiment by PMI. Um, and now, of course, you you know, 50% drop in death rate, in smoking rates, combustible smoking rates in Japan. So the question I, I was thinking of as a behavioral economist is how do we keep in the mind of the ex-smoker the value of having moved from a dirty combustible to a clean le product and heat not burn is cleaner of course, snus and um, pouches are substantially clean even on. And my two crazy ideas was that we should be thinking about our programs um, to actually encourage people to switch. And if they've switched at one month, they should be given a free voucher to take their clothes to be laundered. 
and remove the smell forever. Mm. When I tested this in Japan, uh, I think it was going to be a real hit because from a behavioral po economic point of view, it reinforces um, some of the underlying reasons people were actually switching, which often had less to do with health than to the smell and uh, the dirtiness. The same applies to um, dental hygienists. Imagine if at the end of a month, people had free access to a full oral hygienist cleaning, knowing that they will not have to go back for the buildup of uh, plaque for quite a long time once they've switched to some of these products. Thanks. A fabulous idea, Derek's laundry and oral health, uh, oral hygiene idea. Uh, I'd love to hear, Mihaila, would you like to comment on Derek's question about the similarity of oral cancer rates? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question, Eric. Uh, it's true that we have a lot of smokers, but I think the cancer is not related only with um, the number of smokers. It's true that we have more than 5 million smokers in Romania, which is a very big number. But uh, actually, I think about the oral health exams, this is a problem because usually the, it's a very low access to these preventive methods, I mean, to diagnose early the oral cancer, if we speak only about oral cancer. And um, just because all the people, uh, they, I mean, the, um, the people have to pay for every medical exam, for every dental exam, we, we are not insured for dental uh, treatments usually in Romania, uh, except for some companies that if they are doing this, especially for their, um, for their workers, I mean, uh, this kind of insurance, but otherwise they have to pay for the for all the, the dental exams. So they are not quite, um, they, they don't priorita prioritize uh, the dental exams. Uh, if we speak economically, speak, if we are economically speaking, I mean, they, uh, they are thinking that uh, to go to the dentist, it's only, they begin to go only if they have a big problem, if, we, if they have an ache, if they have a tooth with problems, if they have, uh, if they are experiencing something that cannot keep them at home. So doing prevention, it's uh, something, I mean, we need some national programs. They started, I mean, the Ministry of Health started to do some kind of um, programs, but they were not enough. And I think the main problem is that they have to pay for oral hygiene. They have to pay for the exam. And after, if they are diagnosed with uh, some other sickness or some premature lesions, they don't uh, give enough importance to what's happening to their health. So the oral health means more than I told, uh, as I told before, means general health. So if the health professionals are involved in this, I think the number of cancer will decrease. Anyway, I told, we have big numbers of smokers, but I don't think the, the oral cancer are related only with the tobacco consumers. But most of them are smokers as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Mihaila. And then if we could switch to Solly quickly. Solly, especially to the question that Derek had with regard to the pharmacodynamics of uh, oral nicotine and its potential use in lowering uh, psychotic drugs administration. Is there any insights that you can give us? Well, Please? the truth is that uh, when those patients smoke or they're giving some cigarettes or alternatives, they they are more manageable. So the behavior is controlled. I don't think we have studied this in South Africa, but the reports that have come from London indicate that uh, there's definitely the relationship with the, between uh, the, the use of uh, alternatives to combustible cigarettes and the dosages of uh, antipsychotics. They use less antipsychotics, they use uh, less um, anti-anxiety medication. In, in most of the patients with uh, who are psychotic, uh, there's usually a combination of an antipsychotic medication and anti-anxiety medication. So you find that um, uh, when they are at different times allowed to smoke, uh, they, they tend to drop the dosages of uh, antipsychotic medication, they sleep better, and uh, also there is a reduction in the medication. 
and the antipsychotic medications. So, so that is a, a relationship or correlation that has to be studied further. So, Solly, uh, now we move to some online questions. Jessica Perkins, could you play, please direct any of the questions to our panelists? So from YouTube, first of all, we have the first question, which is for Derek um, from Campaign for Safe Alternatives. Somebody called Samuel is asking, what is WHO's stand on nicotine pouches, first of all? As far as I know, um, they don't have a, an official stand as yet. Um, and so I think it's uh, in a state of limbo as it is in most parts of the world. Um, I did mention that in the latest oral health report, which is really worthwhile reading, and generally a good report, which came out 10 days ago, there's a very large section on oral cancer where I suspected and hoped the word snus and the word nicotine pouch would appear as better alternatives to the toxic smokeless products on the shelf in India. Uh, not a hint, not a word. And in fact, the language is very clear that they say, we need to watch that the nicotine in vaping may actually exacerbate oral cancer, which, as I mentioned earlier, for which there's not a shred of evidence. And he also asks, why has there been resistance to accepting and recommending the product to LMICs from the WHO? I don't have the wisdom to understand that uh, uh, question. I mean, it just seems so obvious to me with my um, little bit of training in epidemiology and public health, that here we're sitting on a solution low cost, affordable, minimal to virtually zero risk, potential to reduce dramatically some of the most important preventable causes of cancer and other diseases. Uh, frankly, I don't know. Okay. So THR Uganda, I'm also asking you the next question. Um, what would you recommend for countries like Uganda, where laws are quite stringent and inhibit accessibility and availability of some low risk nicotine products like nicotine pouches and e-cigs? I think you have to start a trading company and uh, discuss with Swedish colleagues how you're going to be able to uh, bring in high volume of uh, these products into the country. That isn't meant seriously, but it's something that needs to happen. Um, we now have a question for Lars from somebody called Francesco. Um, you mentioned some male deaths data in your slides and Francesco is asking where, what is the source of that data that you spoke about? So male deaths attributable to tobacco in Sweden. Um, I didn't catch the last part of your question. So um, somebody was asking, you talked about male deaths attributable to tobacco in Sweden, and he was asking, where did you get that data from? Oh, the source. The data on death rates I have picked up from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Okay. Yeah, so the Global Burden of Disease Study. Do you want to elaborate on that study at all? No. no uh, what's interesting and valuable about the Global Burden of Disease Study is that they do provide tobacco-related uh, death rates, so even numbers or percentages or those various parameters attributable to tobacco. Most databases just provide total number of lung cancer deaths, for example. But what's interesting about the Global Burden Disease publication, which are available on the internet, is this provision of uh, tobacco attributable figures for various parameters. Okay, thank you very much, Lars. And we now have a question for Dr. Anders Milton. So the LMIC situation remains dire. Smoking prevalence and death are on a steady rise. Who should be tasked with selling pouches? Is it the controversial tobacco industry or independent pharmaceuticals? 
Well, the, we are not talking about pharmaceuticals in the sense uh, of, of regulated pharmacies, you know, and it, which means that it uh, has to be the, the tested industry, unfortunately. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why so many are against SNUs, for example, is that they remember how the industry used to lie in those old days. Uh, and 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 they they the other side don't think that anything good can ever come out of the industry. I'm I, I, I do understand that, but I don't appreciate it. May I just say the 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 uh, to the question that you asked Lars? Uh, you know the uh, as, as I try to say that if we if, if you convert the numbers, I mean, there are about, you know, and, and the SNUS Commission in Sweden, where I'm the chair, uh, we have only used official statistics, no, nothing else. And there are 350,000 fewer deaths per year among men within the European Union that would die if they use SNUS and smoke like in Sweden. So it, it's, it, it's quite large numbers. And the interesting thing is that the European Union does not in any way recognize this fact. Again, we're talking about, you know, fake news, as it were. Milton, um, I have a question for you, Dilon. Um, how long has nicotine pouches or have nicotine pouches been in the market? And what makes them less harmful and at the same time most convenient or the most convenient harm reduction product for a country like Nigeria? Well, we are fortunate to have Carl Fagerstrom in the room. He, 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 he'll, he'll be back momentarily. Uh, but our nicotine pouches were developed, first developed by Carl Fagerstrom. Uh, could you just open the door, please? The first by Carl Fagerstrom with the, the Zonic product, which was uh, more than 10 years ago. But commercially available oral nicotine has been for the last eight or nine years. Um, and, and we have some some manufacturers in the room actually who can who can give us more precise answers. the The issue is more that that the availability of these products were dependent on the regulators in different countries accepting this as a separate uh, product class. So in some countries it was it was accepted as a pharmaceutical ingredient, but only over the last five to eight years. It has gone mainstream as a, a so-called fast-moving consumer product. Uh, we have Bing Tia, who's probably given us the benefit of his insights. The, the first launch of the modern uh, non-tobacco nicotine pouches was in the beginning of 2016, and the brand was uh, Syn. Uh, Thank you for giving me the microphone. I just like I don't have a question, but I think I have some statistics. Uh, somebody mentioned this Karolinska Institute study on oral cancer published in 2021. And the conclusion was that snus use does not increase the risk for oral cancer. But the it also shows that normal snus use, which is four cans of snus or less per week, reduces the risk for oral cancer with 35% as compared to never snus users. This is amazing. And it's fact, <laughs> and it's based on 418,000 male snus users uh, lives, 9 million life years. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Except this, I think, pick up on the, the detail. You know, that is one of the sorts of studies that anybody working in global health should understand as much as they do the big doctor study of Peter and Dahl or the major follow-up studies. The size of that study just blows your mind when you read it. And I suspect that most people, uh, even in the field, in tobacco control generally, uh, let alone on the opposed to tobacco, this stuff, haven't read it. One of the questions I have for, for you, Atakan, is, uh, say, the point I was raising earlier, but they must know 
given the fact that these cohorts and many cohorts in Sweden continue, what are the effects on of uh, during the COVID pandemic of SNUS users? What happened to them? What was their complication rate? What was their death rate compared to never smokers and to current cigarette smokers? That data must be there. It's just not being released yet. Well, a, a comment on the last question. We we, uh, we actually called one of the professors at Karolinska and asked her in this case to if the, she was doing that because obviously 20 20 percent of the male population smoking more or less, and you had a number of patients in the intensive care units which we must have been smokers. How did they fare? What what was their you know life and and for reasons unknown to the world. I mean, non, no, nothing has been made so far. We're moving into the last 10 minutes. Let me just give Atakan a chance, and then there are two questions for Carl. Atakan. Okay, right. So Atakan Befritz from, from Swedish INCO and NLA Sweden. Um, we were in contact with the public health um, agency in 2020 in Easter, asking precisely that question, that the entire world was asking us, can you give us data on how the snus users fare compared to the smokers compared to the non and former smokers and i got the reply that they were actually collecting less data on tobacco status than usual in epidemic upper respiratory infections sadly so and we but we do know that a study was ready by the by late 2020 that was to be released 2021 it was mothballed We've FOI'd a lot of information about it, but there's very little to be had because as I recently learned, black lines matter a lot. So it's basically all redacted. Um, <clears throat> what then happened was that Norway paid a million euros to CES here in Stockholm to do that research again, which they did and did it in Finland. And they just released that paper yesterday. And that paper shows depending on how you read it, but uh, basically their conclusion is a 68, uh, RR1.68 for SNUS users to acquire um, COVID-19. So a 68%, I suppose, increase compared to non-use. Why don't we we'll share that in, in the report of, of, the, of, of our webinar. Uh, we now want to ask some questions to Carl. What was it a greater risk? A greater risk for snooze users to. That's uh, very surprising. Very surprising. No, it seems like it, it, it's, it should be that way around, as it were. Compared to non tobacco users or compared to non? So the news users might have been former smokers then. Yeah. Mm. Fine, thank you. We now have some more online questions and we're busy wrapping up the last five, five minutes. Question directly for Carl. What are your thoughts about the proposed royal decree to ban nicotine pouches in Belgium, please? <laughs> I think they first should ban cigarettes uh, to begin with. Uh, and then, um, no, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, many hard words that I shouldn't go into the microphone crossing my mind now. I, I, I think it's a little bit ludicrous because, um, again, if we think about that it's a possibility to have a, to be not a drug-free world, but a tobacco nicotine-free world, even then it would be very strange. Yeah? Mm -hmm. At least if you think so, you might at one end also come to the point where you should even forbid so beneficial and so little harmful substance or, or administration forms as the pouch. I, I think it's lack of understanding of the larger problem and particularly nicotine per se. Thank you. This is a message to the panel in general. So uh, what is the message the panel would like to send to the Belgium authorities who are about to ban nicotine pouches in a question of days? I have 
have had the pleasure to sign a letter addressed to the Belgian ministers. Actually, I've sent there were four of them, the, the, the way Belgium is run. So I have made my uh, task there in trying to educate uh, the health ministers in Belgium. And more should do that. Uh, education is obviously key here. I think they, they have to study uh, recent scientific productions. I mean, you know, the articles. I mean, it's obvious that that there are ways of getting nicotine that are much less harmful than smoking. And you should use those. Derek, from your side, any, any note to the Belgian government? <laughs> Any more questions? Just two of our speakers, Hossi and Joseph, both have a question. Kind of understanding that the Belgian civil servants and politicians might have is that this is simply going to be a gateway. And it's so difficult to get people to understand that this is not the case, simply because most of the people have seen at least one, maybe starting with an e-cigarette and moving mm -hmm. to traditional cigarettes. And certainly here in Sweden, someone knows about the boy's friends that started with snus and is now smoking. The stream of the others going in the opposite direction isn't really making the market the same. Uh, the... Mm -hmm. uh, No, but I mean, it's it's a question of, of if we can help people avoid dying prematurely, then we should do that. By by by, by no by 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 changing the use. You know, if they if they could change, I mean, for example, if an intravenous drug abuser could use clean needles and syringes, he will not, or she will not die from, from infections. If you can switch from smoking cigarettes to something less harmful, you will survive. Yeah, yeah, but, but but again, I mean, you know, from a medical point of view, I mean, the, the fact is that that you know, you have to, you have to help people survive. I have met hundreds of doctors, medical professionals over the past fifteen years that do not agree with you. They they actually say something else, or they mean something else when they use the term prevention. They mean something else. Well, you have to. And that's scary. Them. Thank you for that, uh, Atakan. We have Hossi and. Joe, uh, questions? Yes. Joseph, do you want to go first? Yes, please. Um, my question is for Derek. Uh, Derek, you've worked in uh, global health for, for decades. Um, how do we hold the FCTC to account um, in terms of asking them what they've done with the available research on oral nicotine products and why they have not considered or nicotine products or even recommended or applied them, uh, especially for countries in Africa and other LMICs. But how do we hold them to account? Thanks, Joseph. I, I think um, the primary set of accountability are the member states, the governments, and we're not doing too well with many of them, but I think there are some starting to shift. <laughs> um, and I think them being more active, particularly when they're seeing successes on using harm reduction, whether it's the UK or New Zealand or Canada even, or the US. I mean, they should be speaking up far more. I think the, the nonprofit and the NGO community also usually are the group who hold institutions accountable when governments fail them. But in this case, they captured, the, the ones in official relations are captured uh, through Bloomberg philanthropy usually. And those who've got an independent voice like sitting in the room here um, don't have an official status. So it is a very tough situation to be in. And if I could add, uh, <clears throat> we're part of the generation where uh, we've been part of uh, the problem in the making. I can remember with World No Tobacco Days when Derek was still in WHO, 
Anders and I, we were running uh, the world, uh, some of the NGOs, the World Medical Association, and some of the other uh, health professional associations. Uh, it was very well intended, but the narrative that we gave to our patients, to our ministers of health, to the WHO was that all tobacco kills and don't be duped. And we wanted to have as uh, draconic and as strict regulations as possible. So mea culpa, many of us were part of creating the wrong narrative. And that's what we're desperately trying to fix. Because to your point of how do you practice prevention, um, it's not only about population health, it's also about individual health. Every smoker has a name. And we often forget that. Uh, in population health, uh, regulators tend to think only of the thousands that die of a specific disease or tobacco-related disease. But individual health is really important to health professionals because that's who you have your relationship with. And that's what we need to change, is to make sure that it's honest, evidence-based, and clear communication to individuals and to populations. There's no reason why it can't be done. COVID proved that. Any last questions from Joe? Uh, from uh, Jose. Jose, yes. Do you want to come on, Jose? Yeah, uh, just uh, just a few comments. One, you know, on what you say, uh, all tobacco kills. I guess what has become clear is that all governments and government agents, or some governments and government agents, kill. <laughs> uh, but uh, we have to live with them and and try and make them useful. We can't get rid of them. But my question, following on. Uh, 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 Joseph's question is, why can't we now, with the evidence that comes from the Global Burden of Disease Report and reports from the WHO, hold them to account for the 350,000 preventable deaths that they've allowed to occur in the past and are going to allow to occur into the future by banning snooze and now banning nicotine pouches? We have to ask people to account. If we can't learn from the past, we're going to repeat it. And now that we have this news experience, how do we get people to account for what they did? Because otherwise they have a license to do the same thing on nicotine pouches and other alternatives that are out there. There was a question uh, from Jewel Sauer about how do we engage with African governments uh, in particular? We just asked them to have policies based on science and evidence and that they should be guided by the science in th instead of taking sides with a particular philosophy. And that there must be open discussions with all the interested parties. That this notion that others have to be kept out of the discussion will not lead to good solutions going forward. So openness, evidence-based solutions, and there should be engagement. And bans do not. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, that, that's all I, I wanted to, 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 to say. And Thank the you. Question, how do we get the WHO to account for the bad advice it has given? Because it, it's, it looks emboldened to give bad advice going forward. And as uh, Carl said, why are you banning less harmful products when combustibles are still legal tender? Well, I, I, I don't want to give you an answer because I don't think I can, but we are trying to get the, you know, Europe, the European Union has a, has a program called Europe Beats Cancer. And they have not accepted the fact that tobacco and smoking kills the under 50,000 people each year. We are trying to convince them, you know, because, but they don't want to, you know, they, they keep one eye closed and they don't read the reports. Yeah, I think we can we we can get um, into a desperate, uh, desperately negative vibe. Um, but I think at the end of the meeting, I I, I think I'd like to look a little bit forward to, forward to the future. Say so we're sitting on a technology and keep it cold and clinical, nicotine pouches with massive potential uh, to save lives. I think we should be thinking about what is it going to take, not not thinking about the role of government, whatever. What is it that we and all of those on this call 
could be doing. And I know that there are people uh, in small and large companies. Uh, there are nonprofits and their academics and their dentists and their doctors and their patients and their users all have ideas. It strikes me that we need to really redouble our efforts to get better quality research on what is working, not quanti not qualitative studies, but large scale interventions to show that nicotine pouches can displace toxic uh, uh, smokeless and combustibles. And in relatively quick time, we can start seeing changes in underlying biomarkers of risk for the long term. And I know we could do this relatively quickly. The question is um, how we raise the finance and get the consortium together. And even that, I'm sure there are people online will have ideas about. Thank you, Derek. And the last word goes to Carl to wrap up our discussions. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure on me. Uh, I would, would also like to um, end the meeting on a bit of a positive note, actually. And uh, I have a history here a little bit longer than most of you others and also more central to, to nicotine. And I can tell you that in uh, when the first nicotine uh, replacement products, it was a gum, were, was about to be approved. It was never a possibility to have it approved uh, as a consumer product. Uh, it had to be through the medical agencies. Uh, and uh, we started with two and four milligram and four milligram was not approved on prescription in all the countries in the US. There were fierce discussions in 1983, which I was part of, and uh, head of the department, uh, no names here, finally said that, okay, we can approve the two milligram prescription, but four milligram will be over my dead body. <laughs> and uh, when I developed the first nicotine pouch that entered the market 2010, it was not possible to see it as a consumer product. Uh, that actually happened when the TPD and the electronic cigarettes in Europe uh, was uh, approved uh, by the European uh, community. That opened up for other products and nicotine, pure nicotine, to be a consumer product before and still, but uh, through court uh, activities, it doesn't seem that the medical authorities agencies keep up with their definition that nicotine, what is a medication? Medication is something can alter the physiology of the human body. And certainly nicotine can do that. And that was what they argued earlier. But after the TPD, they don't seem to find it possible any longer. So and the nasal spray in US was very close to be scheduled, to be scheduled. So we, we have come a bit at least, and a lot of hundreds of thousands probably lives have been saved with the electronic cigarette. And as we're sitting here, there are ticking in saved lives every day by people using pouches instead of smoking cigarettes. Thank you. Well, on that note, I would like to just wrap up by saying what we would like to do next, to answer the call that Derek and Carl have so eloquently uh, given us. So the Oral Nicotine Commission is a broad church, and we stand for engagement. So all of those aunties out there who don't want to have engagement between the various stakeholders, this is probably not your church. We want multi-stakeholder dialogue. We want the conversation to be alive based on ongoing science. And as Derek has said, if there's such an obvious solution to even the most poor countries, then it is a crime. It's contrary to human rights. It's unethical. It's criminal to keep this solution a secret. So we would like to use this commission, this meeting, and we will distribute clips of our discussion throughout the next few months. If you have interesting data that you would like to share from Norway, from Finland, we would like to put that out there as well. Uh, and we would like to encourage peer-reviewed journals to make sure that they carry uh, this topic and that the scientific discussion can be alive and well, because it makes absolutely no sense that people die, uh, adult smokers die unnecessarily if there is a fire escape, fire escape handy for them. 
So on that note, I'd like to thank our speakers, our online speakers, our online audience worldwide, uh, Jessica Perkins, co-moderator, and all of our friends here for a fantastic session together, and we look forward to the next one. Thank you very much.